Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second online public lecture on technology, and today's topic is digital disruption. As you are aware, the University of Central Asia is hosting a series of public lectures as part of pre-conference events for the digital transformation in Central Asia, conference to be held in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, from October 4th to 6th, 2019. University of Central Asia, the State Committee for Information Technology and Communications, and the High Technology Park of the Kyrgyz Republic will host the joint conference aimed at providing IT leaders the opportunity to connect with over 100 chief information officers and leaders in the field within Central Asia and abroad to collaborate and solve technology problems together. I'm happy to inform you that over 20 international speakers from 12 countries have confirmed their participation as a speaker in this conference. To register or for more, further information on the conference speakers and program, please visit dtca.kg or ditka.kg. It's an honor to introduce one of the global IT experts today, who is not only a mentor for high-level technology leaders, but also has exceptional experience in leading the cutting-edge technologies, Peter Thompson, who is currently working as a senior enterprise architect at Cisco CX Advisory in Europe, based in Germany and Denmark. Mr. Peter Thompson has over 20 years of experience in communications and information technology and has worked as an enterprise architect over the past 12 years for Cisco, providing advisory services to major enterprises and services, service providers in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Mr. Thompson sp specializes in all aspects of enterprise architecture and business to IT alignment. He has actively contributed to the enterprise ar architecture adoption within Cisco and has delivered architecture standards and blueprints, provided <clears throat> advice and mentoring in the areas of enterprise architect associations. The activities associated with implementing enterprise architecture vary greatly between organizations, so each client engagement is a unique experience. Mr. Thompson has a degree in electronic engineering, specialized in digital technology from the Danish Technical University. He is TOGAF certified, ITIL certified, open group master level enterprise architect certified, and is an open group board member. Please welcome Peter Thompson. Many thanks, Shukrat. Uh, can everybody hear me? Very good. Let me just bring the presentation up. Thank you, Shukat, for introducing me. Um, as said, I am right now based in Germany, originally from uh, Denmark, and have worked for many years in technology. What this presentation is about is actually not technology. It's about how we are going to go about reacting to digital disruption. What is our response strategy going to be? What are we going to do about it? Because if we think about Cisco, the company I work for now, many think, oh, well, we probably need some endpoint integration, maybe a couple of routers and switches, and then we'll deal with it. But what we will focus on here now is not so much the how we are going to do it. It's more, and with what? It's more around what should we actually be doing um, when we see disruption happening? because of digitization. That's what I'm gonna talk about the next hour. And if you have any questions, do raise them in the chat window. And then at the end of my presentation, 
I will look at the questions you raised, if there are any, and then I'll try and answer as many as I can. I expect this presentation here will take about 50 minutes. Um, and yeah, then we'll go to questions. We may go a little over one hour in total. Uh, I hope that's okay with everybody. So let's get started. I will, in this presentation, talk about four topics, all right? I'm going to talk about what disruption is about, so we understand that. What is digital? What does that mean? So let's get something clarified, and that's what I'm going to do there. So we are clear on what does disruption actually mean. Then we're going to look at a couple of this, uh, digital response strategies. And for that, Cisco has worked together with a Swiss management company called the IMD Institute. Uh, it's an institute for international management development. And together with them, we've done a lot of client surveys and interviews. And we also worked with a lot of the clients together in finding out what strategy works best. So a lot of the material I'm presenting you is actually from this study that we did a couple of years ago. And I will touch on that also in the fourth point that I'm showing here, the keep in mind because things are moving so fast that material that I'm using partially from 2017 and, nine, uh, and 18 had to be updated to reflect 2019. And that's my keep in mind. The remaining part that I didn't talk about now uh, is industry examples. So first of all, we'll look at disruption, we'll look at the response strategy, and then we'll bring it into a couple of examples to better understand what it is for me. And then the keep in mind. And all of that in total, 60 minutes. So let's get started with disruption. But first, a little funny remark that I'm showing here. Does your car have any idea why your car pulled it over, yeah? And that's the situation we may find ourselves in when we look at being highly connected getting a lot of data, maybe we will even be able to make informed decisions, but often we will be in a situation where we don't know what to do. We can see something has happened, but we cannot answer why it actually happened. And this is part of the response strategy we're gonna look at. So let's keep that in mind, all right? So let's first look at the dynamics of uh, uh, the digital disruption. What's happening in that space? Uh, we actually uh, compared with a, a uh, kind of a vortex, a circle. Uh, when water runs out the sink, it forms a circle, a vortex. And in the middle of that vortex, there's a lot of churn and complexity uh, and movement. But the further out you go of that circle, uh, the less is happening. And this is how we view digital disruption. But I'll get to that in a minute. First, the definitions. So what is digital? We see digital as the convergence of multiple technology, yeah, innovations that are there to enable connectivity, by connectivity. And the disruption is the effect of the technologies and the business models yeah, that will be combined result in a market position of some sort yeah and the business transformation that's why we take the organization into consideration as well because it's not just a technology play you need to change the way you run your business those are the three things we will be covering in this presentation so we have the definitions now now we are clear on what it actually means digital the disruption and the transformation those are the three things we need to look at. Surveys, as I mentioned before, we did a lot of surveys. We've actually surveyed over a thousand large enterprises worldwide. And we found, for instance, that two thirds of CEOs sees more threats facing their business today than three years ago. And that is not changing. This survey was done back in 2017. That picture is only getting emphasized today in 2019. 
And secondly, all CXO identified the risk of industry disruption caused by an unlikely competitor outside their own industry as a primary competitive. I have a couple of examples on that. We can take a look at also. So if we look at the basic value chain, um, let me just get this window so I can see my own slide. The basic value chain for companies is most industries has not really changed. We, uh, are you working with, with business management, you understand that business typically are built up around research and development. You have some manufacturing, you produce goods, and then you need to ship that out with distribution. You may have retail that, that will actually uh, uh, be part of uh, positioning and selling and the marketing. This is a classic uh, uh, value chain view. But what's interesting here is, of course, that, that um, there are things happening right now uh, with digitization and being digital and being connected is that Internet of Things is hitting very much on the R&D side, whereas automation, digitization of workflows is happening in the manufacturing side. And there, Mr. Shukat can also speak to what he has experienced from his former role with a pharmaceutical company in Denmark, uh, the disruption happening in the manufacturing side. Distribution is where we see a lot of innovation and acceleration happening. How do you get faster out there? How do you, are you smart about your logistics? All of that. Retail, again, uh, data exchange. Uh, we see a lot around circular economy. Uh, the biggest challenge in circular economy is, by the way, the reverse logistics. How do you get your produce back so you can recycle it? And there's a lot of discussions around how to do that. It's still a very uncharted territory. Sales and marketing are using advanced analytics to make more informed decisions and on-time handling. Yeah. Classic things, nothing new in this value chain with some technology disruptors there or enablers, I would say. Um, uh, for the industry, but it will by some be viewed as a disruptor. If we summarize that in this table, you can see that the Internet of Things, the connected endpoints, the sensors, uh, that's hitting, of course, in R&D healthcare and within manufacturing, we see industrial goods and services and so on. You can read this also at a later stage. Um, the table is, is providing, a, a, for most verticals, a summary of where we see the most disruption happening for the different technologies, type of technologies. An example here could be that uh, if we look at the industrial goods and services, um, General Electric are using over a thousand uh, sensors now, 10,000 sensors, by the way, to collect data. And that number was actually taken in 2018. I just checked with General Electric, that number is now 100,000. So it's going up exponentially right now because the need for data, the need for information so you can uh, do um, predictive maintenance, you can do corrective actions before things happen. That's in, in big demand, yeah. We see with, within uh, the same, same uh, uh, value uh, chain uh, for aircraft manufacturers, uh, they use a lot of testing to simulate crashes. They've established what is called a digital twin, which is something a lot of industries are looking at now, where you have a full digital representation of a uh, physical uh, state, right? So you have, you could be an airplane, could be a car, for instance, Tesla. They actually have a digital twin of every single Tesla model. And with that digital, digital twin, you're able to simulate things. You are able to stress there to test uh, conditions to see if any fault should occur. And then you can recall your product in advance of something happening. Yeah, so it saves lives, it saves money. It's very, very big thing happening. And from a technology point of view, of course, that also puts a demand on how you're actually going to build your network. If you're going to have a digital twin, we talk petabytes of data huge amounts of data. Just so you know, if you move a petabyte of data over eight hours from one point to another point, it will require over 400 gigabits per second. And just to show you the amounts of data and 
the stress it puts on the today's uh, infrastructure and IT in general. Yeah. The consumer products retailers uh, use analytics to improve pricing decisions, but they also use something else. Um, a Swedish uh, manufacturer, Hennes and Moritz, uh, they are, uh, like many other industries, focusing on a circular economy and on the reverse logistics. You can now, in some of their stores, you can give back your old clothes and they will scan the clothes and uh, you will get a certain discount for giving back your old jeans, for instance. You will be uh, then uh, having a, a 5% discount on the next purchase. That's all good. But the key thing here is for them to be able to say how much of what quality am I getting? Because it's about sustainability in production. So they need analytics. They need to know what's the trend, what's the, the most likely produce that's going to be brought back to us in which amounts. So I can use that in my production. Because someone just showing up with a pair of jeans gets a discount. <laughs> and you I think we have an ego. Okay, that's what they need. So they need the analytics to help them in making the circular economy, in this case here, uh, for, for the produce more predictable and sustainable. So again, we are back to technology to enable what the business is looking for, right? <clears throat> but this is about optimizing value chain. And that's, of course, to better compete on price and quality. But the digital disruption is not so much about how you optimize your value chain. It's more around the value play. <clears throat> so what is a value play? Let's look at these examples here. You may know most of these examples. Norwegian is an airline operator. And uh, they asked four years ago for a license to operate as a bank. They got the license and they went out to all of their uh, loyal travel customers who were flying with Norwegian and said, do you want to have simple savings and mortgage, mortgage services? Uh, we can provide that as a bank now. Today, they are the fourth largest bank in Norway. I know it's a small country, a few people, but it's just showing you that disruption may come from another industry. So I could actually go to a bank now and say, did you know that one of your biggest competitors is actually an airline operator? And they may think, oh my God, what are you up to? But that's what's happening. The other example is Starbucks. What are Starbucks making the most money on today? Savings. They introduced a loyalty card to their customers. We all go to Starbucks. And maybe you even drop into Starbucks just before you go to work. Now you do the same thing every morning and you don't want to stand in the queue and wait for your coffee. So with a loyalty card, when you enter the Starbucks uh, cafe, you can, you can uh, prepay and, and, and pay up uh, cash on your card and then use your card for a fast transaction. But it also gives instructions to Starbucks that uh, you need a particular type of coffee. So just by showing that card, they know everything and they charge you. Everybody, or a lot of their customers are doing it, not everybody, but a lot of them, hundreds of thousands of customers are doing that. That means Starbucks suddenly sits on a lot of cash. They are one of the largest savings banks now in the US and they started by selling coffee. So it all disrupts. Vestas in Denmark produces windmills. And they're good at producing windmills. They're one of the largest windmill producers in the world. But what are they good at? They're actually good at predicting weather forecast down to 10 by 10 meters. They can do micro views of uh, weather forecast down to uh, the minute. And there's a lot of people, sailors, farmers, there's a lot of people who are interested in knowing exactly on this 10 by 10 piece of land or area. Um, what is the weather going to be the next two hours? That's something business is going into. That's value to consumers, but it's not about the value chain. It's the value itself. That's what's disrupting. Amazon, I'll get to that in a second. APM terminals, 
um, container shipping, um, the same thing. They're disrupting by um, unifying the, or digitizing the global trade. And what they are doing now is they're providing information to port authorities, to vessels. They can tell vessels how much distance there is between the floor of the ocean and the keel. So if you go into a canal, um, APM terminals will provide information to vessel operators if there's a tide. They can say, enforce your keel to the bottom of the uh, river you're on, or the, uh, uh, maybe you're in a fjord. Um, how much time you have with your load of containers on your ships before uh, you no longer can pass. Yeah? So they have a lot of value added um, services to consumers. And that's the new play. That's what it's all about. If we look at this vortex that I told you about just a minute ago, the vortex is like water running out of a sink. So it's converging, it's unbundling, it's exponential, it's actually chaotic, right? So if we look at that and we look at the industries, I'm now showing you here 12 industries, uh, verticals, there are more than that, but these are the most common. And if we look at those who are the most disrupted right now, that's the technology products and services, it's finance, it's retail, it's media entertainment, yeah? And who's the key player here? If we look at, for instance, Amazon, where are they playing? Amazon is actually playing in most of the verticals. Those they are not into right now, but they are moving into it is healthcare. Utilities, they are not. But the latest I heard, actually, I read, and you can check it in the news, is one of the biggest disruptors in industries right now, and that has changed over the last year, are utilities, the power providers. They're the ones who are going be, uh, uh, through the biggest transformations worldwide. They're seeing disruption big time. And interesting enough, this chart here is from 17, 18, and now we are talking 19, and the picture has changed. Amazon is a company that most industries and, and enterprise owners fear because they don't know what their next move is gonna be. They are everywhere. Um, so let's look at that business model in this, so to say, digital vortex, which it actually is. We're, I talked about value. We can split value into three things. The most common one is cost value. We know this, we, we worked on that. Uh, uh, when you go to the market and you buy some produce, well, if you can get a low, um, a low price, you're fine. But sometimes I'm willing to pay a little more if I get a good experience, yeah? So the good experience is, uh, is important. So you can even allow yourself to be a little more expensive if you give the consumer a good experience. But the new thing in this, so the first two things here, the cost value and the experience value has existed for hundreds of years. Nothing new in that, except from you can optimize, you can be smart about this, and I'll get back to that. The platform value is the new play here. It's the platform value that really is the biggest change changer in this game. And we'll, we'll, we'll dig deeper on platform value. So we have the cost, we have the experience, but the combined is really the very, very powerful um, uh, play. And we know this, everybody knows Uber. That's why I, uh, I introduced it. Nothing new, it's existed for a long time, but they keep becoming or being a pain for classic taxi drivers. And they're trying to, uh, uh, to counter that, of course. Um, and, but, but if we use what I just talked about, the cost value, experience value, and the platform value, I think you can all uh, agree to that what I'm showing here is exactly what it's about. You know, with Uber, you know when the taxi is coming, you know who the driver is, um, you, can play, uh, you can pay on the platform, you can rate each other, so it's a plus plus. But the interesting thing is, Uber doesn't own any taxis. 
yeah they have the platform it's a platform value so for them the key thing is everybody who touches that platform has good experience has a good low cost experience and a good platform value yeah so it's the combined of these three so that platform that you access as either a taxi driver or a passenger for that taxi we meet on that platform and this is whenever you build a platform in your industry that's where you meet yeah airbnb for instance they do not own any real estate but still they are the largest real estate company in the world that's because of the platform we meet there we we exchange information and we have value here's an example from a british bank hsbc now what's interesting when you look at that homepage, that's what hsbc are offering so they have banking borrowing um, they can offer you a mortgage and so on but all these companies that i'm showing here they are playing on value they are disruptors they are fintechs they are um, into the space that the core business of a bank is providing so hsbc is the classic value chain but they are not up to speed with what all these other companies are optimized around and provide super value on and that's one of the biggest struggles they have so for instance hsbc introduced something called the open banking platform so the open banking platform was a way for them to hold on to their customers and say hey don't run away just land on my page and we'll give you what you want but behind their page they actually pointed out to many of these startups and say okay you provide that in, uh, service for me you become part of my value chain so to say but then i have a stronger value play towards my customer that's what it's all about so build that platform so we all can meet there and we can get that cost value and platform experience that really makes a big difference and you will see a lot of that happening going forward now this is one of the areas that's moving the fastest and banks are in particular hit by this because today when i look at my children the way they look at a bank is an app on their phone if the app doesn't load or they don't like uh, how the app, app uh, interacts with you you just delete it and download another app and then maybe a different bank so the customer stickiness is not there anymore you used to go into your retail your banks and 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 have a talk with a bank client or a banker of some sort a specialist in brokerage or maybe just for your savings but they are no longer really in use with the younger generation they don't want that they want it all to be online so if you don't play that game you will lose So let's look at what can you do about this? What would the strategy be about? Um, here's a framework we built up together with IMD Institute. And that framework is really around, just hang on a second, I'm just gonna check the time. Don't have watched, okay. So we have this framework built up to better guide you as a um, a company, for instance, if you are involved in some of the company discussions or you're building a case, uh, then this framework can give some guidance to that. So we have two columns. One is the defense, and then you have the offense. So in your response, you can either be defensive or offensive. Yeah, You can start in one and move into the other. So I will show you a couple of examples of this six stage. But basically the value vampire that you see on the lower left, the vampire, is the one that sucks blood. So that's really the company that holds on, may lower the price, see its competitors not keeping up, but you have enough cash so you can just keep the price going down and the others will die out. That's what we call the vampire. So that's a defensive state. Yeah? You're just waiting for the others to give up. Yeah? And then you have on the other side, you have the vacancy, which is an opportunity for you to move into that space and be a, clear, uh, uh, be a player. And that be, may be also a way for you to survive. So if we look at the left side, the defense, um, 
the uh, what I called uh, the uh, uh, when when a disruptor attacks, for instance, a line of business, a company must decide whether it can fend off that disruptor and win, or whether it's best to move in and just get as much as you can from the business before it declines. Yeah. So the harvest strategy, which is on top of the uh, vampire, so the harvest strategy is all about gaining as much revenue as possible. Um, this could be, for instance, a blocking strategy. Uh, you could do that through lawsuits and regulations. But it could also be um, a strategic investment yeah, to uh, make it uh, profitable uh, in a longer time. Yeah? So on the offense, um, you, can, you can disrupt the market by, for instance, doing the, uh, uh, the platform value play, say like Uber did, they really disrupted the taxi market and they are moving into that. But there are other examples and we'll look at that in a, in a second. You could also occupy space yeah? uh, by, by uh, uh, outcompeting your rivals yeah? and you could move into new markets. It could be that you will actually go in and occupy something that you've seen that uh, um, a Norwegian airline suddenly also goes in and actually holds on and occupy a, uh, a market for banking. So let's look at some of these examples. So basically, this uh, online lecture is going from the University of Central Asia. And explain the, the, the digitalization disruption. And if you will have any questions during the lecture, online lecture, you can ask us so we can try to get any questions. And uh, if there are going to be any possibilities, we can answer to your questions. Okay? Yes. Yeah, good. And that's very good. And we can also use the chat if you just want to chat. Uh, then we look at the chat at the end of the presentation and answer questions. Yeah. Very good. So the value vampire, which was the lower self, uh, left side that we, uh, that we looked at uh, just before the left column. Um, the value vampire is the one that's really gonna uh, suck out the, uh, what we call the blood of the industry. Yeah, so the others will lose out. And two good examples are the transfer wise and WhatsApp. A lot of people use WhatsApp. And what were they actually doing? They, they, uh, WhatsApp had very little cost in this concept they were introducing. And who were they disrupting? That was the telecoms. The telecom operators, they had the biggest revenue coming from texting, SMS messaging. SMS messaging was the biggest cash cow for many, many years. As the cost of voice was declining, they made the most profit on SMS texting. WhatsApp suddenly occurs, and to the end user, there's very little cost. That's much better experience with WhatsApp because you can send pictures, you can uh, form groups, you can you can uh, do a lot of things uh, with WhatsApp that you actually couldn't use uh, SMS texting for. But most of it was actually the same. But the way the app was built and the user interface, so the experience was positive with WhatsApp in comparison to uh, texting. And it completely disrupted the telecom market. Many are not aware of that, but it actually made uh, the larger telecom providers um, uh, changing their game. They had to move out of texting. So today, hardly anybody sends SMS text messaging. Transfer are same also. They were disrupting the banking market because some of the money, most of, a lot of the money at least, that the banking uh, was, was earning was basically on international transfers. Uh, so when you move money from one country to another, it, you had to pay certain fees and there were also some uh, um, fees on going from one currency to another, etc. But TransferWise was, was disrupting this by offering a service that you could transfer money in a secure way, independent of the bank, at a much lower cost. And they had built a platform where you could do this yourself. You didn't need to involve a bank for that. So TransferWise was also building a platform, but specifically for this uh, small part of a bank's value chain. But they offered a better experience, lower cost, and they had the platform. It's again a disruptor. So, 
this year summarizes in total the numbers. We go back in 2013, you can see that uh, the amounts of money that were dropped over the five years when WhatsApp was uh, um, uh, introduced really hit the market. And it's, it's, it's going down even more than I'm showing here. These are old numbers. This is uh, something that really were hitting the industry very, very hard. So if we look at the value vacancy, WeChat, the Chinese equivalent to uh, WhatsApp, this was a value vacancy because they, with WeChat, they saw, hmm, this is an area that hasn't really been occupied by any. WhatsApp occurred, but with WhatsApp, you can only do messaging, you can do uh, voice calls and you can sh uh, form groups, uh, but you can't do more than that. With WeChat, they changed all that. They said, well, we have the platform, it's the same. But what we can offer you now is uh, banking services, mortgages, you can book airline tickets, and we have full access to the social uh, network. Uh, so we can do ratings and you can use WeChat Pay. And everybody in China uses WeChat as a payment form today um, to counter uh, counterfeits, uh, false money uh, in, in, in the country that they were struggling with. WeChat resolved that issue. And that was a vacancy because no one else was playing in that space. They move fast, they are in there, but there's still a vacancy. Personally, I feel there's a vacancy in Europe and in North America for exactly that play that WeChat offers. Because WeChat only works in China. Outside China, you can only use WeChat for the same functions as WhatsApp. So there's no difference. But let's, let's give it maybe a year, and then I'm pretty sure we have an equivalent. Apple. Apple is moving into this space with Apple Pay, and in November, Apple News, they're even adding more to their, uh, to their value play and their value platform. So that's a space we need to watch also very clearly. And that's a vacancy. That's really a vacancy. Yeah, so um, with WeChat, we were uh, converting uh, customers into cash, basically, yeah, or they were. Um, and, and you could see here the operating margins as they were going up. Um, very interesting um, uh, with, with the revenue. And it's, uh, these, these are old numbers. Uh, these, this is really exponential. If we look at 2018 numbers, it's, it's much, much higher. Um, so again, I show you here what, what WeChat is doing. And it's, it's, uh, we just need to watch that space. It's going to be filled very soon in uh, uh, outside uh, China, in Asia, and Europe, and North America. Netflix, everybody knows the streaming service, but did you know that actually they are making the most money from their old traditional service, domestic DVDs, where they're, yet they're shipping the DVD to you, you order it online, you get it two days after, you watch the movie and you return the DVD. That's what they're still making money on and they're profitable on that. But the streaming service, they are not profitable on and have never been. That's an interesting thing. That's the harvest. They're trying to get as much as possible. They're defensive. They're trying to defense off the, the Amazon Prime and now also Apple moving into the space. Uh, so they're trying to harvest it, but they need to change it very soon because that is a tough position to be in because the domestic DVD market is going down. So it's only for a certain time. Then we will see Netflix also changing their play. They will most likely go into a more offensive. You could decide to retreat learn and then enter the market again and be more offensive. But we need to watch that space and see where, it, where it's going. Wealthfront um, is a disruptor. So that's on the offense. What uh, banks also are making a lot of money is, of course, is wealth management, advice on where to invest your money. So Wealthfront, we're using uh, algorithms and had an, um, uh, basically an AI interface to use us. So there wasn't any bank involved. There wasn't any uh, people advisors. It was all formed by software and algorithms they had built up. Very low cost, very low entry fee, and a lot of people are using them today, in particular in North America, to advise on where to invest, invest their money. Um, and that is so informative in dashboard format that people uh, that other banks are actually trying to copy that model to be able to offer the same type of service. 
but they're doing it at such a low cost that hardly anybody can keep up with it because they have this big old base they need to maintain themselves. That's a disruptor, right? Charles Schwab has actually been uh, successful. They are occupying, so they are on the offense. They're actually taking that algorithm, they're taking that model and doing the same, the robo-advisor basically. So they're taking on the challenge. And we can see that with other players. If we look at my taxi, for instance, in Europe, widely used, very successful, exact copy of Uber. It's even the same platform. So my taxi took up the, and faced the challenge and offered this. They could play on experience, they could play on the platform value, but they could not play on the cost, on, on, on lower cost, because Uber is still cheaper. But what are they doing? Well, now that they established the platform, they're now rebranding to free now, which is joined up with Daimler and BMW. And they are offering share now, free now, reach now, park now, charts now. So you can, you can, uh, you can uh, select a separate original taxi. You can also have an Uber taxi. You can also have a several parties sharing a taxi, so code sharing. Uh, you could also select an electrical car. You could drive it yourself if you want. And you can also, through that platform, find free parking space when you come into a city. This is all value play, all of it. And that is a key competitor to Uber. And that's why it's opened up now for Uber, saying, well, we will take you in. And, and if people prefer Uber over us, well, select Uber. Because now, free now is offering more services than Uber is. So again, a value play. So what are we looking at for organizational capabilities? Because it's the last thing we remember when we talk about the digital transformation, we, we have to deal with disruption, but we also need to transform. So what is the secret for this disruptor success? Is it what we see here? Good moods? Happy times. We need to look at a couple of things. We need to look at innovation, agility, and being in experimental. Yeah. And if we look at disruptors and compare that to incumbents, we can see that most of the disruptors have a lot of innovation, a lot of agility, and a, a lot of being experimental. That means fail fast, failure is okay, move on, learn from it. If you don't fail, you never learn. So you have to fail to be better, become better. Now, if you compare that with the incumbents, you can see they're way lower in innovation, agility, and being uh, um, embracing the experimental environment, the risk taking. And on the right side, you can also see here with a couple of examples, um, Airbnb, we all know Alipay from Alibaba, and it's now also uh, WeChat Pay. Um, they're picking up, yeah, because they, they uh, um, even though the incumbents are saying we have a strong brand, we can win at that. Um, if you're not innovative enough, you're not agile enough, you will, you will be disrupted. Yeah, just a little fact finding. But if we take that into consideration and combine what I just talked about, the value play, you build the platform, and we can populate that with a lot of Cisco components or other vendors components, that's all fine. We can engineer that. But if you don't understand the value play, uh, it won't work. So the platform must be built to provide that value. And if we combine it with the right side, the innovative, the agility in the experimental environment, uh, that mindset must be there as well. And it's the combination of those, those two that forms digital transformation. That's the basis. And that's something you need to keep in mind for everything you work on is, are we addressing these topics here? Are we addressing this? Uh, I, can, I can build the best network. I can engineer it to be software defined. It can have centralized management. We can push out uh, policies. We have, uh, so we have full control over changes on the access side. That's all fine. But we need to look at the value. Does this enable me to provide the value? So I need to build now a technology infrastructure with the mindset of it has to be an enabler for this platform. 
That also means you need to consider the APIs towards other players in the market because it's always the combination of data and uh, the correlation of data that gives you the value. Yeah, let's go a little more into that. So we look at three things here. We look at hyper-awareness, informed decisions, and fast execution. Yeah, the hyper-awareness is you must be connected. You must be connected, not just in form of I have an internet connection or a local LAN. Hyper-awareness is also about what's happening in the industry, who are playing with what. You need to know about that. Now, you need to be able to get some meaning out of it so you can make informed decisions. And then you need to, of course, have an organization and you need to have built your technology platform so you can execute fast. Because it's not just about scaling up, it's also a question of scaling down. And it's a question of maybe introducing cloud services, but be able to offer your own private cloud in combination of what other cloud services that are out there. Maybe you just want to be the service broker and say, I'm going to be fast on the market. I'm going to offer this as a service and I will broker that. So that means I may not build it myself, but I will build an interface so I can leverage other services and make sure I also have the quality assurance and, and, and the overall performance assurance uh, in your execution. Yeah, that's a critical part of it. And that requires insights, data insights, it requires tooling, it requires a, a very different way to build networks and infrastructures when you take this here into consideration. And that's why today, business and technology cannot be considered separate. It has to be considered in a um, collaborative way, you kind of converge business and technology. You have to execute on both at the same time. It cannot be that a CEO, an executive tells the IT department, please go and build, we need this. And the IT department says, okay, how much, how high, how fast, how secure? And they say, we have no idea, but you're the IT experts, you build it. But that's not how it's gonna be anymore. Now you're gonna sit as a technology person together with business people who make business decisions. You are together gonna to make that decision and you are gonna move this forward together jointly, right? So a little more detail here. Company's ability to detect and monitor change in its environment. We need to have that awareness. That comes through connectivity, dashboarding, um, and also analytics software that can help you uh, determine when something changes, is it something that's gonna hit you? Yeah, so we need to do our homework in that space. Informed decisions, of course, we, it's not enough just to say, I have uh, just done a, a survey and I can now see that half of my uh, components, my configuration items are actually not in a supported window. Well, that's not enough to make informed decision. We need to have a risk view we need to see what the cost of the change will be and the outcome, yeah? So we need to be able to combine data so it makes meaningful information to decision makers. That's a key thing. And then of course, the fast execution. And it's about time to market, but it's also about building your organization with the mindset that it's okay to do this here in a different way. You work much more uh, with Kanban, Lean, uh, Shrum, um, project management methods with, with DevOps or DevSecOps, which includes security upfront. Um, that's something that's being looked at when you have the end user, the consumer in picture all the time. I keep using the example of building a kitchen. You can build the best kitchen in the world with the biggest oven and the smartest dishwasher ever. But if you don't know what type of food you're gonna serve to your customers, that's going to eat next to your kitchen. If you don't know what they want, then you can be the best kitchen, but it may be the wrong kitchen. It could be you build it up to grill nice burgers um, or steaks and, and, and serve burgers. Um, but it happens to be that the, the, those who consume are all vegetarians. You have to change your strategy. Sourcing strategy is also in your kitchen about should I buy it frozen? Should I buy all the ingredients and build it myself? 
Yeah. So all that awareness of value to the consumer must be thought in, in every single step of your process. And that's a lot of change. All right. So if we look at Bain, who I often turn to when I want to have some status on where we are with things, keep these five things in mind. Uh, because these, these are what I call fail on five fundamental factors. What I've just said, keep that in mind, but look at this here. You focus on disruptors rather than disruption. So we, oh, who's going to disrupt them? Oh my God, yeah. But look at this, what I, I write with small ticks. Netflix didn't kill Blockbuster, yeah? Um, Uber didn't kill taxes. But it's the bad service that you lose on. It's the good service you win on, yeah? So we need to keep that experience, the value experience uh, into this. And um, you build a digital strategy, but um, when you're so busy doing that digital strategy, you're often diverted away from more important goals, such as still reducing cost, higher revenue, increased customer satisfaction. You need to look at that. You need to look at your cost. You need to be smart about that. Yeah, it's the cost value that's still important for you. So don't just focus on the digital strategy, but combine it. Yeah, you pay too much attention to digital disruption. That, that is often what happens. Um, and it does exist, but it's not the only form. There are other, there are political, economical, social shift. There are other disruptions. So it's not just that. But from a technology business play, it's important to understand what it means. And then you focus on digital silos. Often, what, one of the biggest mistakes we do is we digitize analog processes, but we haven't looked at whether these processes are good or bad processes. Sometimes you get a bad process just to work faster. Yeah, keep that in mind and be more cross-functional. You cannot operate in silos anymore because, again, if I'm going to serve to someone who's going to eat my food. I need to think all the processes in my kitchen and not just think about how my oven is working. I need to look at all the others and we need to play better together. So that's also part of that. Uh, focus on those silos and avoid them. Be more cross-functional. And lastly, you pursue agility, but do we know what it means? Yeah, we all think that it's most pro probably well-defined uh, um, um, yeah, well, as I say here, there are at least 10 answers to what is being Agile. Agile is for many DevOps. It's Scrum, it's Kanban. Yeah, and that's, that's of course right. But the most important thing are these three I'm showing you here. Hyper-awareness, informed decision, and fast execution. That's the agility uh, that you're looking for in your organization. And now the next step, now we, we only have one hour to cover, cover digital disruption. The next step that I would see would be very interesting is, so what would a solution look like? What would a platform look like that could be an enabler for disruption? That could be an interesting topic for our next discussion. What I'm sharing with you now is uh, happy reading. There's a lot of good material out there. Um, some of the books, the digital vortex that you see in the middle was written by uh, Cisco. It promotes not Cisco, it promotes digital strategy. It's about what I just talked about. It's positioning Cisco, of course, that we are aware of what's happening in the market. And it's important for Cisco to know this, not just to provide the right products, but mainly to provide the right security strategy because security is the most important topic when we talk about building value platforms and that could be part of the discussion we could have next time, all right? And now I would like to open up for um, any questions that we may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. It's very, very nice as I was, I would I expected and uh, thank you for that. Uh, so one, one of the questions which we are getting from uh, many of our, our colleagues and also I'm getting messages is uh, would it be possible to share your presentation? Yes, it is uh, shareable. I will uh, send it to you. Um, okay. Absolutely. It is information that's generally available. Um, yeah, absolutely.
Excellent. And then the second thing I would like to just inform all the participants who are participating that we are going, we are recording this session and then we are going to put it on our UCA uh, YouTube channel where you can access in two weeks time if you have missed anything. So now, now we can open for the questions. Is there, are there any questions in the chat box, Olambek? Um, we have uh, a couple of uh, chats, but they have already been addressed <laughs> because uh, it's being recorded was one of the questions and also uh, it, that it will be made available, as you said, Shukat, on the uh, UCA YouTube channel. And I will share the presentation also, uh, so we have that um, available. Is there any uh, questions? I mean, maybe the audience had expected a technology introduction. I intentionally did not do that because um, as I stressed in my presentation, it's very important that we understand the market and now we can come in and do a technology play, but we need to keep the value discussion in mind. So uh, one question, uh, Peter, because uh, we are from the University of Central Asia and I can see that there is a Karakorum International University sitting there and then there is the American Space Technology Institute are also watching you. So for an institutional point of view uh, to prepare for this digital journey, what would be the three guiding principles you would suggest for us? For you as an industry? Uh, yes, as an educational industry. Yeah, exactly. So uh, one of the first thing is um, it's a very changing market. So stay, uh, stay up to date on what's happening in the market. There's a lot of new things happening. The, the second principle is keep in mind the value play, the price, the experience and the platform value. It's a space that's absolutely going to be humongously big in all aspects but the third one is think about the market and the industry as when you go in and produce a product or, or purchase a product think about that what your experience is and sometimes i know you may uh, even have had that experience um, uh, you come home with a produce you bought something and then you've been, uh, you, you maybe uh, your spouse asks you, why do you pay that much? And he said, well, I know I could get it cheaper, but you know, it was such a good experience. It was such a nice environment. They even served coffee and I, they had a Wi-Fi, So I really felt good. So I bought that there. Yeah. So you see that that's the, it's, it's back to human nature. That's really what it is. So technology is still there. It's not changing, but we need to keep in mind human behavior. Thank you, Shukat. Thank you, Peter. Um, so we, we will just wait for one, two more minutes if there are any other questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, sorry. Uh, one question. Um, thanks very much for the uh, great presentation. I had a question, um, I'm not a technical type person uh, at all. Um, but I am looking at a company doing consulting around uh, different industry issues and so on and looking at the opportunities, say, for things like um, Internet of Things specifically. And what advice or what ideas do you have or how do you see companies that are, again, not using tech in, in its history but looking at that maybe more as a tool to, to break in or providing this information and timely um, business intelligence and so on. Yeah, very good question. Thank you very much. I hope we have time because I, I have uh, something I want to tell you also. Um, when, when you work in IT, as Cisco is a player in, IT is about building an infrastructure, building a local area network with some access points and so on and dimension it so people have good performance experience. But when you move into operating technology, IoT, the Internet of Things, or maybe not just the Internet of Things, but of things. So it's everything connected. So you may have a lot of sensors, sensor gateways. Uh, you connect information. But it's a different food chain. I, I sometimes uh, compared with uh, my daughter once asked me when we went into uh, swimming in an ocean, she said, uh, are there any sharks here? So I said, you have to, daughter, accept the fact that 
uh, when you put your foot into the ocean, you enter the food chain of a shark. So I cannot rule it out. I can only say, well, the water is cold, so it may not be here. But when you go into OT, it's a different food chain than uh, when you're in IT. So for instance, as a company that has not been uh, uh, focusing a lot on technology and now start to uh, collect data from uh, various devices that are connecting up, this is operating technology. And the difference from IT is if an access point goes down, uh, you may likely have another access point or people can physically move and continue to work. Or if a cable fails, well, it's only that one desktop that's gonna fail. But in operating technology, it's a different story. If I'm a manufacturer, like Shukat uh, worked for uh, a pharmaceutical, had a leading position in the Danish pharmaceutical, that was the manufacturing side. And he had a lot of people coming from technology into that. And, and, and uh, we spent a lot of time in explaining, well, guys, in this area where we are connected up with a lot of machinery and endpoint sensors, when some of that fails, it's really not good. It will cost us money, production will be disrupted, we may lose money. Um, so it's, it's when, when you move into that space, you need to be aware of what you're doing, not just from a technology point of view, but more from a criticality point of view. How critical is this? It's nice that, that I can get information and I can maybe also have someone to provide a tool that correlates information so I can make sense of that and, and, and have informed decisions. But the critical part here is understanding security around the endpoints and the criticality if something fails. Could be that you have an, a, a cyber attack. It could be that uh, through a life cycle management process, something gets operated and doesn't work anymore. You need to be aware of that. So you need to be much more aware of your own criticality in your environment before you get someone to do it for you. Because if you're not technical competent, you typically outsource and get someone run it for you or build it for you. But if you cannot specify the criticality of that, that's where you fail. So you have to do your homework and say, this is my business, these are my critical processes. And now I will sit down with hopefully someone in technology who understands it and gets it, and you build your SLAs with them. That's really the space that is a big challenge for many. I hope it answers your question. It's a very broad question also. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, I think we are already over, over the time, so I would like to Hello, th yeah. thank you very much for your time and very interesting presentation. And then for, for all the participants who, have, uh, who are connected at the moment and who were connected before, thank you very much, everyone. I hope you got a lot of information from this presentation. And if you are interested, as I mentioned in my, uh, my uh, introduction, that we are hosting an international conference here in Bishkek. Uh, you can get all the information from dtca.kg. We, we will be having around 20 international renowned speakers uh, coming here. It's a three-day conference, so you're welcome to register if, if you are interested. With those words, thank you very much, each and everyone, and thank you, Peter, for your time. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Bye. Thank you. Bye.